So apparently the universe is in the key of B-flat, according, that is, to this article from the New York Times interpreting this scientific study published in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. Jazz musicians rejoice you have successfully tonicized the universe? <laughs> So here's how it works. Astronomers studying the Perseus galaxy cluster observed pressure waves emanating from the supermassive black hole at its center. Now, these pressure waves are slow, like incredibly slow, completing a period of oscillation about once every 10 million years or so. For reference, the deepest, lowest notes that humans can actually perceive have a period of about 1 20th of a second. So we're talking about a B flat here that's uh, approximately 57 octaves below middle C. In other words, the bass note coming from this galaxy cluster is just too bassy for us mere mortals to comprehend. But fortunately for us, music math exists. So if we take the frequency of this incredibly low tone and multiply it by two enough, we can bring it up into the audible human octave range. This works by the way, because the human brain perceives frequency doubling in the audible range as one to one. Meaning if you double or half the frequency frequency of A440, your brain will still hear it as an A. This process of developing data into sound and music we can hear and engage with is called sonification, and the good people over at NASA made hearing Perseus a reality. This is a representation of that puzzling rumble lurking in the dark some 250 million light years away, now heard 288 quadrillion times higher than its original frequency. I'm not gonna lie, that is pretty darn cool. But I just gotta say it, this whole B flat thing is a little bit inaccurate. And no, I'm not gonna talk about the efficacies of sonification, that's, that's a whole nother video. I'm talking about their music math. Because when we actually sit down and do the math, what we find is that this note coming from this far off galaxy, this supposed B flat, is actually a little bit closer to B half flat. Hmm. Microtonalists rejoice. in its infinite complexities and messy realities reveals itself to once again be predictably off-grid. But come on, I suppose it's probably easier and clearer for science journalists at the New York Times, Scientific American, the BBC, and NPR, just to name a few, to round off this B half flat for science communication purposes to something that most readers will, I guess, actually recognize. So uh, why are we talking about this? What does this all mean? Well, nothing. Really. It doesn't mean that the universe is tuned musically in any particular way. It doesn't mean that if you make your music in the key of B flat, or excuse me, I guess the key of B half flat, that you'll somehow be resonating with the natural frequency of the universe or anything, or that somehow your music will be objectively better or will somehow promote healing or any of that new age BS. But I do think it's a really neat way of contemplating how we engage with all of the different speeds of our universe. What do I mean by that? Well, if you take that B half flat, some 50 seven octaves below middle C and start to speed it up, it'll eventually reach into the range of human hearing as rhythmic clicks. With more speed, more cycles per second of oscillation, our incredibly low rumble literally becomes rhythm. If you keep going faster and faster, eventually that rhythm will gain enough periodicity to literally become pitch. What happens if you speed up pitch beyond the range of human hearing, like way beyond the range? So instead of 40 to 50 octaves below middle C, what if we went 40 to 50 octaves above middle C? What would happen? At speeds of trillions of times per second, a wave wiggling at a multiple frequency of B half flat becomes lime green-ish? That's right, the relationship between sound and color 
lies in the speed of vibrations on a wave. Granted, and this is a huge caveat for you science lovers out there, they are different kinds of waves. Sound waves are pressure waves made up of compressions and rare fractions where light is fundamentally electromagnetic radiation. So you couldn't literally do this. But we can take the frequency of each of the 12 notes of our chromatic system, double them enough time so that the hertz of sound becomes the tetrahertz of visible light, and actually visualize music on the color spectrum. This is D minor. This is A major. Thinking of color in this way could make the experience of art fascinating, don't you think? Let's take a listen to what Van Gogh's famous painting, Wheatfield with Crows, might sound like if it were translated mathematically from color on canvas to frequency on air. This is the wiggly waves of art slowed down by a factor of quadrillions. Analyzing art through music becomes infinitely more interesting when we recognize that the depth of color in, say, for example, Picasso's old guitarist is not limited to the strict color swatches of an equally tempered system. D minor can become D sub minor. A major can become A super major. Some chords find themselves so complex, they transcend the practicality of names. It's not just blue that Picasso painted with, after all. It's Prussian blue and stone and azure. It's not just a brown guitar that the old man strums. It's a carefully chosen blend of taupe, green, and ochre, a nuance which no doubt was chosen with melancholic intention. Does that melancholy translate to sound? With the flexibility of sonification, we could pretty much make anything happen. But what if we limited ourselves to the frequencies of Picasso's imagination. Many of these colors cannot be constructed with a single wavelength of light. They require similar nuance. Blending together complex combinations of notes is needed to get the hue just right. Consequently, what we find in the work of Picasso is a rich tapestry of color sound clusters, microtonal chords, and harmony that weave from coal gray to a hemlock green in a seamless fog of harmonic ambience. This is Picasso's old guitarist. <laughs> Metaphorically speaking, Picasso was microtonal. Most art is just like the universe is, and it's beautiful. 
what hidden harmonies are yet to be found inside the works of Dali or Cezanne or Chagall? Does Monet's impression sunrise sound like how it looks, how it makes us feel? The artist Kandinsky claimed to literally see color as he heard music, a condition now known as synesthesia. To him, sound and color were inextricably linked, and you can almost see the music in his paintings. F.W. Murnau once described his work as a filmmaker as being all about trying to convey tonal chords in space. The artist Goethe famously argued that architecture is music frozen in time. When it comes down to it, whether we're musicians or artists or architects or physicists or astronomers or just everyday people, we're all just trying to, in our own limited way, make sense of the wiggly waves all around us. I hope you have a beautiful day. Huge thank you to all of my patrons now on screen for making this video possible. If you'd like to see an extended cut of this video that goes deeper into the microtonal theory behind what I'm doing here, or how it relates to color theory, or the math that goes into calculating oscillations of black hole pressure waves, consider supporting the channel over on Patreon. When you sign up for the microtonalist tier, you'll get access to a bunch of my lectures on microtonal music theory for the modern musician, as well as all the resources and tuning files you could ever need to get you started on your microtonal journey. We await you with open arms and, of course, a whole lot of notes.